Hello and welcome to Escape Alive. I'm here with Eric Biddle. How are you doing, Eric? I'm oh, sorry, Eric. Oh, God. Ryan. Don't worry. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> No going I, got, I was so concentrating on getting your last name right, I forgot your first name. Isn't That's it okay. always the way? So no apologies. Um, so Ryan, a very interesting sort of bio story. Um, you know, when I came across you on Twitter uh, and asked you to to come on and talk, I just thought, wow, perfect guest. I think you're gonna you're gonna answer a lot of my questions and hopefully a lot of questions for get my guests. So. Why don't you start by telling me a little bit about your story and how you got to the point where you seem to spend most of your time in paradise uh, blogging about it? Well, first off, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Uh, I basically, I had worked so many nine to five jobs. This is over, ooh, now we're looking at like 15 years ago, that I tired of just trading time for money. You know, grew up in New Jersey, traditional life, wasn't a traveler at all. I mean, before right. I flew from New York to Bali, my last vacation was 25 years prior. So a, a true American here in a lot of ways. Yeah. But, but the fact was, I just, I tired so much of trading time for money. So I looked to the blogging world. And initially, when I started my blog, I wasn't really thinking about traveling. I was thinking about right. being a homebody, but I just wanted freedom. Okay. So... My wife and I decided to start circling the globe. The blog had taken off a little bit uh, as we kind of leaned into it, but went to Bali and that was now almost 11 years ago to the day. And I've just been, believe it or not, yeah, it's come so quickly when you do the travel bit, you know, nonstop, basically it flies by, but I've just been teaching people how to be professional bloggers. And a lot of folks who follow me happen to like to circle the globe too. So basically what I do at Blogging from Paradise, which is a site I run, is yep. teach people how to become full-time bloggers. Okay. And if you want to blog from anywhere in the world, that's uh, a place where you can learn how to do it. Yeah. And so, so just uh, following on to uh, how you started, how long do you think it took you until you were in a position where you more or less were making enough, uh, enough money that you weren't just dipping into your, your life savings? Uh, at least a couple of years, at least a couple of years, but I was also very unclear in the beginning. So okay. I think most bloggers, they have a tough time making money because the dream looks amazing. And I think people experience that little bit of spark, but they don't understand who you have to be right. as a person and as a blogger to reach that point. And I think most people, they're not so much traveling because they have a passion and a love for freedom and building a blog because they love helping people and growing a thriving business. They're really fed up and disgusted with their current life and say mm -hmm. their current job. Uh, so they're taking that energy of fear and scarcity and trying to get things done as quickly as possible with them. And then that's where there's just so much problems with driving traffic and finances and profits and all that. So for me, at least the number of years, and I think for most bloggers who've gone pro, it's got to be for most two to three to four years just to get everything foundationally set to allow yeah. things to really pop. Good. No, no. In, in, interesting. Um, I'm looking at your, it's, it's interesting. I'm looking at your book because you, you're also an author. How, how many books have you written by the way? It's interesting. Now I have about, I think on my blog, six or seven, I want to say seven ebooks out there. They're kind of like manuals because it's like step by step instruction. Mm -hmm. But initially, Martin, I actually wrote over 120. <laughs> and I put wow. them bite, bite size, bite size. We're talking like 5,000 to maybe like Okay. 15,000 is my top one. So they're not long. They're more like short bite sized guys. But I wound up pulling them over the years because I had them on Amazon and they didn't really do as well. And I think I lacked a lot of clarity when I initially wrote them. I mean, they're still very helpful. But, mm -hmm. but now I think I'm down to just as far as getting a few out there. And that was really one of the lessons I learned too. It's better to have a handful of books and promote them properly to spread the word rather than try to get as many out there as possible. And again, this is something we learn. One of the many many, many lessons as an entrepreneur that we pick up along the way. So right now yeah. I want to say about six that I have on my blog. Okay. So, and how long did it take you to write each one? Do you think? Uh, 
uh, well, when I was doing that 126, I was writing a 5,000 to 10,000 word ebook uh, in two hours a day. I was putting oh, it yeah. about so two, so two and a half hours. It was a real inspiration at that time. But these, uh, I want to say my flagship first few, those 15,000 where I really went in depth with the practical tips, it took about, I would say, three days to five days of just putting my head down and really devoting a lot of time to it to make sure that I'm really clear and it's just you know, an endless, basically a manual, a guide where somebody could buy it, read it, and they have something to really reference to take them from A to Z. Right, right. No, no. It, yeah. Well, that, that makes that makes good sense. And it, it obviously provides good value as opposed to just hearing hearing the fun stories that aren't really going to take you very far in terms of the practicalities of of the of the job, as it were. Yeah, yeah, I think exactly. Although it's a pretty nice job. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And it's funny, too, because some people, that's what, I mean, I've just run across so many types of people over the years, and some people want the funny stories and the lighter stuff, but most people, yeah, they want the practical tips because they're thinking, we think how to, how, okay, great, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I go so deeply into mindset because the practical tips are really important, but so many bloggers have access to these tips and they ignore them, they misuse them, they use them for three weeks and they're like, well, I haven't retired to the tropics yet. So you see it really comes back so much to mindset. So I really drill down on that through my blog and through the courses and also the manuals because it's just most bloggers and, and people who even wanna travel, I think they wanna travel, but there's so much fear in their mind about letting you go, even for a short-term trip, let alone what my wife and I have been doing, you know, nonstop digital nomads for 11 years. Yeah. For a lot of people, that sounds cool and also horrifying because you got to let go. Well, there's no safety net either in a sense, yeah. right? You know, You're just moving. Yep. And you've got to trust in people and trust in, well, basically humanity to help you out. And and have you have you had to experience any situations where you know where where you where you needed that kind of help? Yeah, I mean, as emergencies far as- <laughs> or or crazy. Well, what, what, what was the, what was the craziest thing that happened that's happened in the last eleven years? Uh, this is an hour long podcast. <laughs> we can go on as long as you want. Literally, my whole thing is long long form. Mm-hmm. You know what it is? I've, I guess with us doing this for so long and being like, basically, I'm going to go back home, you know, New Jersey and the States a number of times, but spending so much time on the road. And for whatever reason, I've probably had about 20, 25 genuinely crazy experiences. Right. Um, a pair of lady boy, uh, a, street walkers tried to rob me and grab my arm in Bangkok. I had a couple people, one guy in Kathmandu, like bit my arm. Um, just like, yeah, I <laughs> tried it. He asked me, he asked me for a certain amount of rupee for a buttered roll. And I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have it. And he went to start chewing. I'm like, so I've just, we helped um, slay a, a spitting cobra in Bali. It got into the chicken coop. So I've had a number of kind of wacky off the wall experiences, but just in general, I would say, Nothing specific, but a number of situations on the road where there were language barriers, there were cultural barriers. And if you have this sense of trust, like you said, the goodness of humanity, I genuinely believe in my heart that even though we appear to be separated, that we really are all connected. And it comes back to you through other human beings. Like I remember once when we were in Costa Rica, we were traveling on a Sunday, and in very rural areas of Costa Rica, Sunday is very much the Lord's Day. So everything is either closed or closes down by noon. Right. So we traveled to Playa Petro. No, I'm trying to remember if it was Playa Petro. It may have been Nueva Arnal, but where we were leaving from, it was a very rural area. It's a remote. So one guy kind of took us for a ride, literally, in one of the party towns, and he charged us like 25 bucks for a ride that should have been two or three. So I was really annoyed, but I paid it. And I'm like, okay, this is the, the gringo tax. You know, it happened. We were stuck. He had us. There was no more buses running. But then the next guy charged us 40 
you know, an honest individual. And the guy took us for the ride. He was laughing the whole time. He didn't know he spoke Spanish. So what he's talking about us, I'm like, I can, you know, I just played it cool. But mm -hmm. the next guy it was 40 for like a two hour ride. And he was just explaining this idea of not only a very fair price, a generous price, but just how from that part of Costa Rica, there's just a lot of folks that are in a partying and a lot of problems. And he's like, yeah, he took it. And maybe it seems like, you know, he won, but he's going to take that and, and just spend it on drugs or liquor or women. And it will be gone in five minutes. So I was thinking about whenever we face experiences abroad as travelers, where we think it's unfair or just seeing the worst in people in, in the ego through the ego you yeah. always have to remember that so much of the world in their mind, a decent chunk comes from a, 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 an intent of fear and scarcity in one part of their mind. So they may do stuff like that, trying to take advantage. And it's not about karma. It's about this concept of almost forgiveness or forgiveness, letting it go, overlooking it. And when you're able to do that, you'll find that you'll see not only the good in people, but they'll come to you to your aid to help or to add clarity or to help you see cultural differences or to communicate. So that's been the number one lesson I've learned. I mean, I think of that experience in Costa Rica, but we've had that happen in a lot of places. When you let it go and you're like, all right, this is part of traveling, you'll see that it wasn't a bad experience or a negative experience, but it was just something to reveal your mind to you and your fears to you and oh i thought this would happen i thought this would happen and it did but it's not to you it's for you to learn from and then other right. folks will come right in and kind of add some clarity to the situation so so that's one experience that comes to mind yeah no it's it's interesting because what in my my short trip to mexico um i at one point i noticed it was like hold on a second in back in canada if this had happened to me I would have freaked out and got really angry and I didn't. And I'm wondering why. And I started thinking about that a little bit and I realized, well, I, I should really get down here because I don't know what it is, but it's making me feel better. And the other thing I realized is like, well, wait a second. It's partly because I'm on, I'm away from home. I'm sort of on vacation. I'm, you know, I'm experiencing new things and I'm not bringing all my pre preconceptions with me. You know, in a sense, I'm just sort of saying this is the way it is here and I'm going to accept that this is the way it is here. And once I did that, it all clicked in place. And, you know, I never had I didn't even nothing happened after that, you know, that that got me got me riled up in, in any way whatsoever. And I think that's a little bit what you're what you're saying, right? It's sort of embracing, embracing where you are and what's going on and the people and the way they are. Most definitely. The mind is all powerful. Yeah. Our intent is all powerful. And when you change your perspective on things, and even if things that appear to be a lot more intense mm -hmm. or crazy, or a little fresh, you know, that may trigger some stuff, the more you understand that it's, that's one of the reasons why we travel just to yeah. see our, you know, perspectives and like you said, the preconceived ideas and how things are back for you in Canada, for me in the States, or even just in the West, or yeah. even like a place like Panama, like when we traveled there last year, we couldn't upload any videos. It was a very remote spot and the internet was okay for basic work, but video uploads and it wasn't a big part of my wife's or my businesses, but it would have been nice to do. And we called this one individual six separate times or sent him a text. And each time, I mean, in Spanish, but he's like, I will be there tomorrow. I promise. And six separate times over three and a half months, he never came. And it was just this like, for us in the West, it's just such a different mentality because after the first time, you know, most people culturally business, your word promises, you've got to be there. If you're not there, bad reviews, this, that, you know, you go out of business so fast. Whereas in a place like Canada, we learned, and again, this is stuff that you mainly learn when you're down there experiencing it, how since that country makes uh, a significant part of its uh, economy is really dependent on the Panama Canal and then um, certain activity that uh, has been famous over the years. <laughs> like, uh, what, we've, what we heard, money laundering is still a huge part of yep. the economy where the service industry is not like a place like Costa Rica or well, Mexico as much, but like a place. So it's just, it's not that people don't care. It's that they're not conditioned business wise, service wise to really, and we've kind of seen the same thing in Thailand too. And it's, it's nothing to do with 
it's nothing personal. It's just culturally, it's a different mindset. So we learned when he didn't come six times that it wasn't, it wasn't personal. It's like, Oh, I'll get there. Oh, I couldn't get there. And it's just, you just, you understand. So we weren't, and it's funny too, his name was Jose. And after the first time I remember telling my wife, I'm like, this is going to be, I think maybe a no way Jose. I'm like, he won't show up for the three and a half months. And she's like, all right. And six separate times. And it was like, that's just how it is. So rather than yeah. being fired up over it, you start laughing at it and then you go and we're on to the next spot. And it's like, or, you know, when you're like waving for the waitress, it's not, we would never do that from frustration or agitation, but just understanding that you really do have to be like, hi, in a nice way. And then they're like, oh, hello. Because if not, they'll look down on your phone. They're not going to walk up to you. And it's yeah. not anything other than the fact that that's how the service industry largely is there because they don't feel that they need to culturally. Yeah. Where in a place that really is dependent on it, oh, yeah, they'll give you the best service possible. So, Yeah, well, that, that, that's what that's what I was thinking from what you were saying, that it, it's it's – it's not as high a priority no. because they're not surviving. It's not like Mexico where, you know, where I was down on the, the Riviera Maya. It's like, that is the whole economy. Yes. More or less. So they go out of their way, you know, the, 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 the ones who are successful really go out of their way to help. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. So, so I'm just, I'm just looking at your latest book, what, how to retire to a life of island hopping through smart blogging, which is a very good title because you really say what it's about <laughs> with a, you know, wonderful picture. And so the first thing is tips for retiring, how to start your journey. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because that, that's something that, uh, that that's dear to my heart at the moment. So I'm, I'm very interested in it, and I'm sure other people will be as well. Sure, sure. I mean, right now, the main thing that comes to mind as I've really gotten clearer and clearer on this, this journey is mindset mm. and the idea of the intent. If you want to retire and live abroad and blog abroad, you know, build a blog yeah. as you're doing it, you really have to fall so deeply in love with the idea of blogging and retiring to the tropics to be free that you will do the things that really scare you, that feel really uncomfortable, that help you not you know, officially cut ties entirely, but that help you put your old life behind you to yep. move into your new life. So really that more than anything, the practical tips, that stuff's important, but you really have to have it in your veins, in your blood, because it's so easy to scamper back and to say, no way, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I mean, going abroad and all the resistance. And then you'll see too, you'll see nightmare stories from expats in certain places and they'll say, don't go there. But it really wasn't the place, it was their mindset. Because a lot of yeah. expats that go to these places, they're running away from problems at home. They're not wanting yeah. to go to yeah. Thailand or, yeah. I mean, I've seen that many, many times. So, so if you get, oh, sorry. No, but so, oh, so what you're saying, no, what, what you're saying then is on the one hand, what, what popped up in my mind was you have to do the uncomfortable things like contact people who you don't know just randomly, like, like I did with, with you. Right. Um, and, it, you know, and hope that you're going to come back, but realize if you don't, it's the next person and don't take it personal. just both went down okay we're fine yeah. interesting um and the second thing is i guess you have to cut the ties with where you are because I, i'm sure you you guys travel with a couple of suitcases right i'm not sure yeah, yeah. two suitcases so all, um, all, of your, all of your toys and all of your nice nice things they're all you've left them behind yeah i i have a carry-on. I travel with a carry-on. I don't even travel with a suitcase. These carry-on, backpack, laptop, phone, which I don't really use that much. Yep. And that's a week's change of clothes. And now we do this full time. So literally we're homeless by choice. Like we, yep. we literally travel nonstop. So if you have a place 
and you plan to go back and forth, or even if you're doing a digital nomad bit and you have house sitters, you know, for it's a, a certain amount of time you're doing it, you may keep more things. But the thing I've just learned that if you really focus on having experiences rather than thinking that a thing is going to make you happy or give you comfort or, or, or warmth or, or peace, then I think even people that are living the, you know, homebody life would still let go a lot of their stuff because they start seeing like they think like something's going to make them happy when it's always the frame of mind and with traveling like do, how we do it or even if you're not traveling like full-time digital nomad for a year or for years the more you release these things you start to understand that you never really quote unquote really on a, a genuine level needed them and you kind of have to because if you're worrying about them and thinking about them, it pulls you back to the past or in the future back home and you're thinking about home and then you're not present to enjoy a Mexico or a Thailand or I have to worry about this, I have to worry about that. And it's, yeah. again, mind, but really when you think about it, yeah, you're going to have to cut a lot of ties in a lot of ways because you're moving into a different way of living. Yeah, yeah. Although, although with all of the ability to stay connected over things like WhatsApp, exactly, it, it's a different world than it was, you know? I mean, Fully. that's something I really noticed. Even with my trip, I ended up getting a SIM card for my phone and could call to Canada for free. And so it was very easy to keep in touch with my mom and give her a call every day or whatever, you know, to make sure that she's doing okay because she's getting on in years. Um, and it's unlike years ago, I like my, my story is I lived for about 11 years in Vienna and Austria. My next, my ex-wife is Viennese. So I, I went through that where I basically, you know, traveled over with two suitcases and when things sort of fell apart and I moved back to Canada, it was one suitcase and two or three boxes of, of stuff that I had shipped back. <laughs> so and there's 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 good there's good sides to that too, right? Having you know slimming down and not not living for your possessions, as it were. Yeah, yeah. When you dissolve the attachments, when you dissolve the attachment <clears throat> to these things, you clear a lot of fears out of your mind. And as you clear more of those fears out, you see more clearly. <clears throat> excuse me. You think more clearly. It's just life becomes a lot easier when you're not worrying about literal stuff or things yeah. and management and it's it's very simple yeah. to think but um emotionally yeah it can be challenging and i think that's why a lot of folks they resist the life because they think oh my home my house my my cars and it's all well and good to have these things but if they're representing some massive part of you or your identity then it do want to think about your life and where it's headed if you think your value is based on a thing so yeah. <clears throat> we kind of know it, but when you really think about it, it's like, oh yeah, that, that is kind of true. And that's why traveling, it's, it really forces you to lay things bare. But like you said, the technology has changed so much over the years. I mean, you could be in touch with people through so many different ways and means and Zoom calls and Facebook. So yeah. it's a blessing in a lot of ways too, where you can still keep bonds with people, mm -hmm. but the thing uh, largely, they're going to have to go unless you want to be mentally jumping back and forth between time zones and stuff like that. <laughs> which, which doesn't, doesn't make any sense. No, uh, absolutely you know. not. And, and the, the, the other thing is I think that, and I, I noticed it every time I've traveled, I think you have to really open yourself up uh, to new experiences. You have to be open to meeting new people, uh, which, I mean, it was, it was striking. I guess it's just my, my I, I've always done that quite easily. It's like I, I, I'll, I'll talk to people, you know, it's like if I'm sitting alone at a table and the restaurant's busy, I'll invite people to sit at the table with me. Uh, and, you know, and you end up always meeting interesting people by doing that. Is there the, the people that will sit at the table are generally also the open ones <laughs> in, in a sense. Or I ended up meeting these two, two really nice people that I've stepped, stayed in contact with and we've been friends uh, because we were both waiting in line at a restaurant to get in that was busy and I was on my own and it was the two of them. And I said, well, do you want to share a table? I mean, you won't have to wait, you know, because it, and it makes it more interesting than me being alone, sitting alone at a, a restaurant. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, 
You, you think it was it was like, you know, the simplest thing in the world, but how many people do that, right? And, it's and just was, opening your mouth. <laughs> yeah, and what was what was striking, I get, came back to Canada and I really, I, I literally noticed the difference in sort of big city Toronto, the way people react to each other. And especially at the point they, they hadn't dropped the mask mandates and stuff like that. So there was still, everyone was with their mask. And if anything, it just created even more barriers than there, than there were a couple of years, years ago. Right. You know, yes. so on, on that topic, how have you found traveling sort of during the last few years with all the res restrictions and lockdowns and, and stuff? How, how was your experience with that? We largely weren't affected by it only because the only international trip we did since the beginning of, you know, heavily restricted travel yeah. was Panama for five months. So outside of that, <clears throat> the first year, right when COVID started, I was actually in Brooklyn at the time. I was actually in New York when it really broke, yeah. like in the States. And obviously it started in New York where it just spread wildfire. So I was there, I remember walking on the uh, Brooklyn Bridge the one day and I saw like, and it's funny because it wasn't in the new, it went from zero to 60. The one day it was like on page six or seven of the newspaper and then the next day it. So that day between when it was on page six and page one, I, I remember walking down the Brooklyn Bridge and there was like 30 people on it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. And it was that quick. So, you know, went back to New Jersey after that. And the first year we were in um, NJ, we were just sticking around, you know, home state. But then after that, we just did trips throughout the U.S. for a while. And we kind of went to more rural or even remote areas where there were so few people. It wasn't really a yeah. thing, you know. So when we went to Panama, it was – pretty restrictive right before we got there <clears throat> but the day we arrived this is actually on my birthday they dropped a lot of restrictions so yeah. other than masks in public places mm -hmm. there really wasn't too much going on until we left about two weeks before they started locking people down on every sunday uh, in the one town we were in but other than that it was just have a, a negative test to get yep. in. So we got our test, we got our rapid test, handed it to the lady. She barely even looked at it. I mean, it was funny too, because the form looked like something that you or I could have created in uh, with a PDF. It was just so unofficial. There's not even any testing, like, like lab work. So, but we went and got it. So yep. other than that, yeah, it was really as far as our travels. Now, that being said, our favorite region in the world is Southeast Asia, which has been just about the most, you know, one of the more strict, I should say. Obviously, you guys in Canada, Australia. Yeah. So it's definitely been up there. So places like Thailand and Bali, we likely would have been there years ago if uh, you know it hadn't occurred. So that would probably be the main thing. But we we went with it and decided to see a lot more of the U.S., which we really hadn't seen mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we'd been travel snobs. It's like, oh, if I can go to Virginia or Fiji. I'm probably going to go to Fiji. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like most people. So, so we were doing that Fiji, New Zealand, you know, that gorgeous part mm -hmm. of the world, but it really caused us to stay in the States and really appreciate a lot more the Northeast, the deep South. Uh, so it's been cool. We've really learned a lot more about our country uh, with us being U S citizens and enjoyed it a lot more and just seeing it's, it's such a big place. It's just has so many yeah. subcultures. It's almost like in a way, it's almost like 50 countries in a country because every state is pretty dramatically different in its own way. So it's been fascinating. Yeah. And it was also, there was also a big patchwork of regulation and yes. places that, that were much more strict and locking down than others. So yes. you could, which was one of the big problems in Canada because it was very even difficult to go from one province to another. Mm. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy here. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's interesting because I'd, I'd hoped to be doing some travel before and I've never been to Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's sort of off the, the cards. I'm going to wait to see what, what's happened because I, I just heard some absolute horror stories with with the lockdowns. And I can't I can't think anything, you know, I can't think of anything worse than being locked in a cooped into a little small one room apartment where you can look across you know the street and see the beach that you're not allowed to go to it's, it's like 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I ended up going to Mexico, because I think Mexico was one of the few places that uh, I don't think they locked down at all. There were It was state to state. Mm. And when I was there, the biggest restrictions were um, you basically did a temperature check Mm -hmm. which went into all the larger stores or stuff like that and put on hand sanitizer and wore masks. And that was about it, you know? So it was very, yeah, which, which which was okay. I mean, I, you know, that's easy enough to deal with and, uh, but, but it wasn't restrictive. They weren't trying to have you wearing masks on the beach or, you know, you weren't wearing masks outside and stuff like that. So, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's changed everything, you know, in terms, in terms of traveling, huh? It's a it's a little bit of a different world than it was three years ago, let's say. So so tell me what was your what, what was your favorite spot in Southeast Asia? Where would you go back to first when when you're when you're taking your next trip? I would say it's a, a draw. It's a tie between Bali and Thailand. Okay. They both offer different things. Mm-hmm. Bali, there's no place that I've visited that integrates culture into day-to-day living. They have over, I think, 300,000 altars all over the island, and they right. burn the incense. So as soon as you land and <clears throat> you start, or really an airport, you smell it, the beautiful incense, you know, fragrant. But they have their ceremonies every week, and everybody gets dressed up, and it's really integrated. And the scale is cool, yeah. too. In a way, it's almost like Hobbiton. Everything's very small. The okay. roads are very tight. The cars are small. So that's awesome for its culture. Beautiful people, uh, mm-hmm. peaceful, generous people, yeah. gorgeous country. And then Thailand, you all, they also have a lot of culture uh, integrated in the day-to-day living with the Buddhism and the monks walking up and down the streets. Yeah. And very friendly, Thai locals, smiling and greeting, gorgeous country. And the food is just – I'm not a foodie, but Thai food – in Thailand, Bangkok. Like I've said, I've gone to a lot of restaurants over the years, you know, actually before I started traveling where I go to certain, um, you know, really quote unquote high end restaurants a few times. And the best meal I've ever had is a dollar thirty mixed vegetable tofu, green curry made by a lady in Bangkok on the street where the napkin is a, a toilet paper roll over your head that you pull down. <laughs> And it's just the best food I've ever had. It is unbelievable. So there, their food is just off the charts, so good. And it's like a buck a plate. And it's hygienic, you know, very high standards health-wise. It's not as much like a developing nation in that way. So I've never been sick there. I mean, I've been there, I don't know, for over two years. Never got sick to my stomach, never any problems. Um, But, yeah, those two countries, well, Bali's island of Indonesia. But Bali, those two locations, Thailand, definitely in a dead heat, I'd say. Yeah. No, nice, nice. No, I, I, I really, uh, uh, what, what's, what's the name of it? Uh, the, the runes Angkor Wat. Oh, are, I are totally on it. Like that's on my bucket list. So I'm definitely going to hit that region of the world at some point. It's worth the trip. The scale, yeah, is, the scale is amazing. You can't, when you see it, we went right in the beginning of our trip. It was like over a decade ago, but it took us about, I think, two days and the scale I mean, the main building, but then the, just the size, it's just, you cannot, it's difficult to fathom how the technology at the time, how they built something so big. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. No, I, I had a similar experience uh, because uh, one of the nice things, especially in the sort of Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico is the archaeology there is also yes. quite incredible. And I was in Coba, mm. which is uh, one of the larger sites. Uh, it's not it's not as famous or as developed, uh, but it was also I think the scale of it it's forty square kilometers or something like that. The size of the the, the city it was a major major place at at one point. And we literally the guide when we went on our trip said spend the extra you can rent bicycles. And so we all rented bicycles for, I don't know, 50 pesos or whatever it was. And it was the best decision you could make because literally on the two, three hours we were there, we got to see, you know, a good bit of it because we could ride around from one location to the other. 
And and also the other thing is you I think it was the last of the pyramids that you were allowed to walk up. Oh. It closed a lot of them, right? And that was that was an experience at like eight o'clock because we went really early and we got there as soon as it opened. And so we walked all the way up the really steep pyramid. And what was interesting with that, you you know, you wondered, is it why is it so steep? You know, why did they they do it? Because it was very like it was treacherous coming down, right? And and the guide said, well, it was literally it wasn't it wasn't wear, it wasn't erosion, whatever. It was built like that so that you had to prostate yourself all the way up. Uh, it's literally yeah. the only way you could go all the way up is like on, you know, is by pro by literally on your hands and knees. And it's anyway. But but yeah, the, the archaeology and and just, you know, and that's also one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm going to start in Mexico. Is there's just so much to see there. And in the sort of Central America, you know, in Honduras, there's a lot of sites and uh, and I, I and I've seen some other things in, in, in Central America that I'd really like to see, too. Um, but anyway, and then Peru's not far away. And that's interesting. And because we're really in, in sort of Mesoamerica, there were four or five major, you know, major civilizations. Uh, it's very similar to like the Middle East, let's say, in terms of just the amount of history that happened there, you know? Yes. Um, and that, that's, that's a fascinating part of travel. I find culture is fascinating, but also seeing, you know, and realizing just how long some of these civilizations have been around, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, you obviously Southeast Asia too. They're very ancient societies. You know. Time, time, the time element. When we went, we did a house sit in the Cappadocia region of Turkey, and wow. we were in yeah six months. We've done a lot. Of, I mean, we do rentals, but since 2014, I mean, most of the places where we stayed, we've done house sits, which has been awesome. We're in a house yeah. set right now. Yeah. So we did it for six, about five and a half weeks in Ortigesa, Turkey, small mm -hmm. little village off the tourist uh, track, off the tourist path. And yeah. when you're talking to locals, because they talk about, oh, history, historians will say some of the stone buildings in town, like in the books, they'll say mm -hmm. a couple thousand years. But the locals know seven, eight thousand year old houses that are in not historically that are in the town where you are like next door is a 7,000 year old uh, cave house, a stone house that looks like something yeah. out of star Wars. Even the place where we stayed, it was an expat couple and they completely redid it stone house. It was just, and then you have the fairy chimneys in the distance. And when you think of some of the places where we walked through in the Balkan Valley, you had, these Byzantine churches carved into mountains, carved, and they're yeah. talking about the troglodytes living there, back to the Hittite, and you're just like, wow. It's yeah, so no, it's blowing. It, it, well, the, the whole, I mean, you know, yeah, I, the, the, the site, I can't think of the name. Uh, what is it? Gobiliak uh, Tepe? Uh, I'm, 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 which which is I think, one of the oldest sites that they've found in the world yeah Tur oh, yeah. turkey is, turkey's been around for a, there's been a lot of things going on there for a long time oh yes you know? or like petra is another place that's on my list uh that i i definitely want to see um as well as there's also the that uh that whole series of churches that they they actually carved out of the stone in ethiopia as well Mm. That, that that is another place that I'd absolutely like. I don't know if you've seen those ones. I have it's not. Incredible. Not. It's literally uh, they literally carve them out of the mountains, like buildings, and the building is all one piece of stone. That's been it's unbelievable. Mm. You know, it was in the early the early Christian church, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia was also one of the earliest areas that was converted and have have their own tradition for it and and stuff like that uh, and you know it was maybe the the lost tribe type thing you know but but it's also it, it's anyway we <laughs> this isn't a history channel <laughs> i'm sure we can go on for hours just talking about that kind of stuff um so 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 just getting back to you know uh i'm, I'm just going through like the chapters of of the book and one of the things that I think is interesting, you say, it's like pick a topic. 
uh, for, for a blog. And I think that that's an important thing is to, to have a clear idea of, of what you're going to talk about, because I guess that gives you a route into actually saying something, right? And, and organizing your thoughts, would you say? Yes, because I think a lot of bloggers, when they start out, they're like, I just want to blog about what's on my mind or what's important to me. But I, yeah. I just want to remind folks, when you look at the offline world, the world loves specialists and generalists, not so much. So if yeah. you just want to talk about what's on your mind, number one, you're going to be a generalist, so it'll be a jack of all trades. And number two, why would someone follow your blog if you're just blogging about what's on your mind when they're only going to follow your blog if you're solving their problems? And when you Good solve point. one core problem as, say, a blogging tips blogger or a travel blogger, that's how you get real credibility. That's how you become known as a leader in your niche. And a lot of new bloggers don't think of themselves as eventually down the road being credible or being a leader. And this is where the mindset comes in again. You really have to get clear in the beginning. It'll give you more confidence. You'll be tackling a topic from different angles. You'll be able to specialize more. So that's why we really want to stick to one niche so you could specialize and be seen as being credible. Because if you try to cover multiple, you could have – a certain amount of success, but most mm -hmm. people, if you're covering two or three niches, they're going to be like, well, how does this one person cover three niches better than the guy or gal that covers one of them all the time? Right. And we, most of us think that way. And you'll see the difference between a, a blogging tips blogger that does it full time for years versus someone that's sharing, trying to cover blogging tips, internet marketing, making money online. You see the quality of both blogs. You're like, wait a second. Yeah. And they'll leave the, the, you know, the generalist behind. So definitely one niche and something you feel passionate about. And that yes. solves a problem because you got to do it for quite a long time, generously and patiently and persistently before the traffic and the money arrives. And if you're not doing it for that or for some external driver, you'll quit. And almost every blogger really does. <laughs> they pick that yeah, money months. driver, traffic driver, it doesn't come lose their motivator, forget about it, you know, after yeah. a week, a month, or even a year. So yeah. it's, you have to have the passion. Yeah, well, it, it's also, I, I found like with this this channel, um, it was amazing. I ended up throwing up this video that did quite well, and it actually motivated me to get started again. And of course, when you, you know, because I'd had the channel for a number of years and, and did things, and there's nothing more demotivating than, you know, you, you put your heart into something and you, 12 people watch it, <laughs> you know, or, or, what, or whatever. It's like, you, it's like, you, you know, you, you spend all the time on your birthday party and no one shows up. Right. It's the same kind mm -hmm. of, the <laughs> same kind of thing. Uh, but, but for me, what was interesting is after sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall with trying different things out, what, what I, what I found is that, you know, as you said, when you blog about yourself or vlog or whatever about yourself, it isn't all that interesting to anyone else. And so for me, the real thing was I found, well, wait a second. I, I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy finding out people's stories. I love having conversations and meeting new people. And that's got to be more interesting than just me talking about myself, you know, <laughs> and, and so far. Yeah, so cool. unless, unless you've lived like I tell bloggers, I'm like, unless you're already a celebrity, you've developed yeah. your skills, your credibility in some area where people are like, oh, I got to see what's going on in life. Or you've lived a life that's just, you've had so many unbelievably wacky, out there, zany experiences. Like some folks have been like, hey, and I don't, I blog, I put the stories out there here and there, but I'm mainly about blogging tips. But they're like, oh, you should make a Netflix series. I've had about 30 really incredibly wacky things that have happened. But, yeah. um, but these are just rare cases. And with me, that's years and years of just traveling all over. And most people don't do that. And if they do, they go to tourist spots. Like my wife and I, we do some tourist stuff, but we really go out there sometimes. So, yep. you know, in the middle of nowhere. So overall, yeah, it's solving people's problems because they're showing up to have their mm -hmm. problems solved. Yep. And if you're listening to them and you're linking to other bloggers on your blog and you're building your friend network, at work and doing interviews like this and podcasts and that's where you really get that synergistic effect where you start tapping into that quantum field that oneness where things really start to move however they do they just do yeah 
Yeah, and and I think it it's something we spoke of before we started off that I think is important in terms of that that too, and it's something I learned quite easy early on in the whole process is like you keep your in terms of something like Twitter, you keep your DMs open, mm. you know, because the number and it's sort of shocking to me the number of people because I, I just started this the my my Twitter account recently when I I got into you know deciding this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to specialize on, on these sort of long form interviews. Uh, and you quickly run out of friends to interview, <laughs> you know, or, or people that'll, you know what I mean? That'll, that'll do it, do it as a favor. And so you've got to start eventually reaching out to other people like yourself. And it shocked me the number of people that are just, you know, they've got small little accounts and, you, there's very little way of getting in touch with them outside of leaving a, a random comment on some some post that they made, some tweet they made, and hoping that they maybe will see it at some point. You know, and I, I did. You, you have any idea why uh, pe people are acting like that? Uh, there's a number of issues, I would say, a number of causes, but the one that really comes to mind is a subconscious fear manifests as self-sabotage. So it's like, I want to blog, I want to do this, but since this is unconscious, it's subconscious in the back of my mind, I'll write off Twitter or I'll stop by once a week or I hate Twitter or I hate this or I don't want to be bothered or all these jerks reach out to me. I've been spammed so many times. Like a lot of bloggers close, and I did for a while too, but they closed their comments <clears throat> when this is an incredibly potentially incredibly rich source of free content anytime yes. forget about the engagement comments or content yep. you think of facebook and twitter you have user generated content that has earned individuals tens of billions of dollars <laughs> so when people yep. close the comments on their blog because they're afraid they've been spammed in the past again holding on to the past and not being present yeah and it's just they're shutting themselves off and i did it for a while too just to test and i, I just felt like it was too much but then when I open back up, you just see how quickly, yeah, I got spammed quite a bit, but that's just part of the business mm -hmm. and how quickly engagement increased. And now I also have uh, links open. I mean, there are no follow links, but if you put a link to your blog or your podcast on Blogging from Paradise, you'll get a link. So it's not a Google link, a link juice link, but it's exposure on a yep. site with, you know, some viewers. So it's that idea again most bloggers and individuals and podcast, they just have these unconscious blocks that they're doing these things that repel success and prolong failure. And then the ego, what it does is it will complain and say, nobody reaches out to me. And then they'll look and see, oh, wait a second, a couple of people reached out last week, but I haven't checked Twitter in a week. And it's you snooze, you lose. This is all, everything moves very, very quickly. Everything is yeah. in the moment. So it's something I really go so deep into mindset. And most of my posts these days, I mean, uh, the book, ebook you're talking about is my flagship one, How to Retire to a Life of Island Hopping Smart Blog. And I go into mindset, but then lots of practical tips. But really, over the past few years, most posts are mindset because I'm just seeing these problems again and again and again. Like the other day, uh, somebody reached out. And obviously, I get this a lot. I'm trying to remember what post it even was, what the um, – well, I've had people reach out <clears throat> and they just want to get links on my blog and how can I get a link or, or sometimes like a new blogger would be like, Hey, just do me a favor, stop by and comment on my post and spread the word on it. And I'm like trying to explain, I'm like, if it were that easy, we'd all be billionaires. You don't tell someone who's an established blogger to do the work for you, but you see how the ego is. It's, it does things that are insane. Yeah. So I'll write a post about how, well, I'm connected now and I'm becoming more connected, you know, popping up a little more because I helped a lot of bloggers for a long time and asked for nothing to earn their trust to prove that I was interested in befriending them, not in what they could do for me. And I learned that from a lot of the top bloggers in the world. So I write a post talking about the mindset and it's just, you can't do that. And you got to really put the vibes out there, reach out, help people engage. Like even you, you're like, hey, how are you? you Want to be on my podcast? And it was just like, boom happened so quickly and you generously extended this opportunity to me, you know, so you could chat with your followers and your uh, listeners. And it's like, it's just that instant, let's get together and create something helpful for people yep. versus, and that's the right mindset versus 
oh, I don't have anything to do with uh, individuals and I just want to get money and I don't want to be bothered with it. And I just want to write a post and publish it. And nope, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what, what I've noticed, too, is that there's a real and you notice it. There's a real difference between the people that I think have been really successful on social media and and know how to work it. And those that get embittered is that social mm -hmm. media is not a competition. It's all about cooperating and and finding synergy, right? Because I'm not I'm not competing with you for for viewers. If anything, hopefully I'll send some your your way and you'll send some mine my way and we'll both be happy and, and our viewers will be, you know what I mean? They'll be enriched by it because they'll find some value in it, right? Uh, we live and, and, and it, it just shocks me, like I said, with the whole DM things, why would you not keep your DMs open? I mean, especially on Twitter where you can mute, mute and block people. It's so easy. If, some, if the spammer's there, you block them. It's one time. It's one little click and it's done. You know, it doesn't make any sense. No. But like you said, you're completely right. It's, it's really a mindset thing. Yeah. So, so tell me, what are some of the other mindsets that I should be looking at, right, to help help build things and keep things rolling? Because I had a lot of success with my last interview on this channel, and hopefully this one will go just as well or even better. What are some of the other other tricks to really getting the right kind of mindset to 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 be successful? I think I came across a quote from a book I've been reading and studying, and it it is give all to all. And when you think about that one, that's really going to trigger a lot of ego, like, wait a second, you work for free. and that, But I'm not saying that you're not going to start a business eventually, but especially before you've monetized, just think about how could I be the most generous human being possible like that's going to be it boom i came across someone they seemed interesting they have something to yep. share let me say let's do an interview on my podcast and boom it's like instant there, and there's no hesitation there's not well what am i going to get out of it or yes. how is it going to benefit me and it's like that give all to also being generous mm -hmm. being persistent and trusting in the process too because if you pay very close attention one guy i follow on social media who's really been a very positive influence on me is this individual named gary vaynerchuk i don't know if you've heard of him no. he, he actually grew up one town over from me in new jersey i didn't know this like a couple of years ago after he's super famous online but um he's probably the number one social media guy in the world in terms of not just scale i don't know numbers per se but he's definitely up there but doing it from a pure, generous, altruistic intent in so many ways before he became worth $200 million. <laughs> so it's like he's worth a quarter of a billion and he's telling you, I did this for so many years without making a penny through this exact channel, but he's always building relationships. And he's one of these guys with millions, I don't know if it's millions of followers, but he did amount of people he responds to is staggering. And there's actually a top blogger who I follow up, I'm friends with now, Zach Johnson, who's from my native New Jersey. And this guy's just started in the late nineties. I mean, we're talking online. So we're talking one of the real blogging pioneers. Yeah. And he always responds to every email I've sent him. I hear other folks that maybe aren't as established blogging wise and like, yeah, he always responds to me. He like lives to serve. So really mindset wise of what you're doing and just anybody listening it's going to be tough because the ego is going to say, no, what about me? And want to be stingy and hold back. But like my blog, I've pared it down to get clear on putting out, you know, higher quality posts. But at its peak, I had like 5,000 blog posts. Even now it's like a thousand or 1200. I've published thousands of guest posts and it's not about the number. It's just about that sense of detachment. And when you pay close attention to the happy <clears throat> yeah. prospering entrepreneurs, the happy ones, the ones that build these like really high energy empires that are loving the ride. I think a guy like Gary V, they just give so much. They don't even think about it. And when you're just helping give all to help, 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 help all the friends you make and all the value you put out there, it'll come back to you. But the cool part is by that point, your mind has become so evolved. 
you don't make a big deal about it. You're like, oh, the success is nice, but you see why these happy billionaires and multimillionaires, and I didn't forget about, you know, worldly outcomes, just happy people. Like, I just love helping people, and that's why I'm here for. And I don't even think about the money, and it's not a big deal. And when you have that sense of detachment, however energetically it happens, those are the folks that really build something special over the long haul. And they're just lost in helping people and listening and connecting and doing what they can. And the outcomes really you have to have a business mind on some level, but the outcomes genuinely take care of themselves. And I can't put it into words how it happens, but it just happens. <laughs> yeah, no, it's something I'm really working on is just being more generous. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other big thing I noticed since, since I've started and well, with doing the two different channels is being organized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because the, the other one, the other one is, is, uh, that I have is a similar, similar format, but I'm, uh, I'm interviewing and speaking with fellow independent musicians. And with them, I've had no problem finding uh, people to interview because, of course, you know, a musician, artists, they, they like nothing better than talking about themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and their work, right? Um, so it, it's been an interesting experience. But the, the issue there is I, I've got I, I've got a backlog already. I launched the uh, the I launched my channel a week ago or something like that or two weeks ago. And I've already have a backlog of interviews that I've done. And, you know, I, I, I reached out to a whole bunch of other people and everyone says yes. So now it's just a question of not you know, getting, not disappointing people by forgetting them just through sheer being overwhelmed with the amount of work, because there's a lot of, as you know, with, with blogging, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. It isn't just the hour, hour and a half we're going to spend together talking, right? It's also the, you know, the, the production end afterwards, or in your case, editing, and then you've got to figure out how to distribute it, and you've got to promote it, and you've got to you know, deal with all the technical issues. Why, why don't you tell me a bit about the tech, technical issues I'm going to face? And they're going to be times 10 because I'm doing video. Well, you, you, you do video as well. I do so, some. I would say, like, my videos are a lot more rough and ready, so I don't yeah. run into that as much with video. But just from the blogging side of things, like, technical issues arise when you buy, you have your domain and hosting, and... You know, your site might go down sometimes or it may slow down or another thing I've experienced over the years as you scale and you blog generously and you stick to proven strategies, you're going to get more and more readers and viewers. And when you're on your own site, you bought your domain and, you know, you invest in hosting, you begin to realize that the perhaps and most bloggers go this route, the cheap yeah. hosting that was awesome at seven dollars a month. Uh, for the year, it's like, oh, yeah, it's great, 96, whatever it is, you know. Uh, that doesn't do too well when you start getting yeah. real traffic. <laughs> and when your site starts crashing and going down 30 times a day and people complaining, and people complaining as much, but just the idea of your site's not up or it's loading, it takes 30 seconds to load. So that's yeah. when you realize, like, technically, okay, it's time to pay for the premium hosting and pay 20 or 30 bucks a yeah. month or I'm on a VPS now, virtual private right. server. So it just, it has to be that way. And then also too, when the site has issues, I have a developer that I work with who's tremendous. I built a, I really built a strong friendship with him before we started working together, basically. So he's phenomenal based out of the UK. And he just, you could hire anyone, but I would strongly suggest the more anybody gets into owning their own website, to yeah. really become good friends with a web developer. <laughs> Because they will help you. And you can get work done. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of really skilled, reputable folks out there. But when it's, I mean, if you go through a, a big box, you know, a hosting company, they're going to have some tech people handle some things. But overall, yeah. when you start having some sites, site problems and it starts crashing, you're going to want to have someone who's responsive and compassionate and level-headed and really calm. And he's definitely that guy for me. So I would say just... Videos for me, I don't really go as in depth with those, but, and I think too, like you'll just learn is like everything in life, but you know, business wise and blogging wise, you kind of learn as you go along and things yeah, well, are right. Obviously. And what's interesting too, is I think that the, the moment you plunged into it, right. You're in a, you, you you find yourself in a situation where you have to solve the problem. 
Mm. But if you spend all your time thinking about, well, I'm not going to do it for this reason or that reason or whatever, you won't solve any problems because you're not going to have any challenges. (laughs) No experience. You need experience. You need the toughest part of this journey for me really was just, I was so programmed subconsciously to think like an employee. Whereas when you're an entrepreneur, there's no, there are certain aspects of being an employee that could definitely help you. They're somewhat applicable and similar, but it is such, it's like thinking for me, it was like thinking upside down during my employee days to thinking right side up during my entrepreneur days where you own everything. You take ownership, full responsibility, anything happens. It's not so much that it's your fault, but you have to own that it has happened. Yeah. Find a solution, hire someone to get us, you know, to help you out with the solution. Uh, work with people, ask people. You have to humble yourself. When you're talking before about crawling up the humble journey to the top of the pyramid, I think that's a very apt analogy for being an entrepreneur. <laughs> get on your hands and knees. You have to be humble. And the more your ego calls the shots, even if you get really good doing a lower energy thing of manipulating people to get money, first off, you'll use your reputation eventually. I've seen that happen so many times with people. But you see how it just causes so many problems. And when you put it to the side and ask for help or help other people, being generous, nothing in return, just being like, I don't understand what I'm doing. I'm failing. I admit it. These are those incredible turning points where you see some entrepreneurs seem to succeed so much more quickly. And I struggled for a long time. It's that they pushed their ego to the side and did the uncomfortable but freeing things of just saying, hey, I'm humble here and I'm struggling. And either I'm going to help a ton of people, start building my friend network and putting the content out there and just getting my credibility down, or I'm just at least going to help someone be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Let me buy your book. I'm going to buy your course and learn from someone who's been there. Yep. Especially the mindset, you know, just guys capitalize on the experience of seasoned bloggers, podcasters who offer not only free content, but really detailed courses and manuals, eBooks. These folks will help you avoid years and thousands. And when I say thousands of hours, I'm not kidding. Thousands of hours of nightmares and headaches because I have taken that journey and you do not want to look back at certain points. And I don't regret anything because it all happened for me, not to me. It goes back to ownership. But you re- you do not have to take that route when you have so many folks like myself who say you don't want to, you don't have to experience that. But if you allow the ego to call the shots, you will. It, it it happens all the time. So, yeah, no, I, I I'm 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 lucky enough that I've I think I've gotten past that. <laughs> but I think that's a, yeah. it's a you know one of the few advantages of growing older, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. balances all the you know balances all the 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 other things, you know all the all the the challenges of it. That's been one of the ultimate blessings of being a world traveling entrepreneur, I did two things that are two of the most uncomfortable things for us to do. It's like circle the globe nonstop. You are sometimes just rocketed, pushed, shoved out of your comfort zone in in cultures, different languages, different customs. So that's one thing. And then at the same time, building a business from scratch. So it's like those two experiences, I'm only 47, but it's like, When I have a lot of people with decades on me, they're like, you have this perspective. That's kind of weird for a guy in his 40s. But I'm like, well, if you circle the globe nonstop for 11 years, that's the beauty of experience and being out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Totally out of your comfort zone. And it's been such a blessing. And it's something that I know it was my calling to help me to share with other people. If you're willing to do it even short term, It'll be so fun and freeing. And then any of your shadows and fears that are really holding your back, they will be reflected back to you when you travel somewhere like India. And everybody has to go to India once. No, they don't have to, but I'm talking on a worldly level. When you go to a place like that, it is so phenomenal. And I loved it, but it will trigger so much stuff because for most Westerners, really much of the world, but especially Westerners, it is just such an uncomfortable thing to see that mirror, the guilt, the fear, the sadness just 
tears coming up because you'll see things there that you just don't see in the States or that don't yeah. see in Canada or in a lot of the world. And, and it, I've studied a lot of mystics over the years and I'm deeply into yoga and, mm-hmm. you know, different states of mind. And a lot of Indian mystics say India is perfect, like the world in general, being exactly how it is because it really helps people see where they're at in their mind and gaining experience and facing their fears and getting rid of them. And that's one of the beauties of travel. It's so much fun. And then it frees you of these fears that you never, most people are just until they do some serious mind training, they're not going to face these fears until they go abroad and whoa, all your preferences out the window and all your love of comfort. Goodbye. <laughs> but it's fun too. And it's neat. That's what's so cool about it. Yeah. No, it's, it's also a place that I'd love to love to visit. It's just, you know, mind boggling how much history happened there as well. And, and how many cultures I, I, I don't, I don't think people realize just how many different cultures are part of the subcontinent and religions and languages and, uh, it's not a homogeneous society in any, oh. any shape, shape or form. Absolutely not. There are places we traveled to that there's Kerala, which is just an absolute stunning place. It reminds me so much of Bali. That uh, area is actually communist. And it was like, wow, that was interesting. And not only that, but we went to the restaurant and they were serving hamburgers. Mm-hmm. We were like, hold on a second. We hadn't seen meat in two and a half months anywhere. Yep. I mean, this was before they were doing the vegan things in fast food places or vegetarian, but they were serving just veggie burgers in the restaurants because, you know, it's just mm-hmm. it's a veg- largely vegetarian. So we yep. hadn't seen a hamburger. Not that I was, I mean, my wife's a vegetarian and I've been for a while now pretty much, but um, it was just stunning that, com- oh, it's communist. And you see too in Kerala, uh, a lot of Muslims. So it's like, it's its own little country. Yep. And then by there, it's different when you get towards uh, Aleppo. And it's, it's amazing. It's so many countries within a country. And the people are so nice. Food's amazing. And again, it's just, it, it's so, it just rockets you outside of your comfort zone. So there's a lot of fun and joy. And then, yeah, if you have some sh- dark shadows back here, it's going to bring them up for you to face, which is beautiful because that's how we really grow through these experiences. Yeah. Yeah, which which I think is at the end of the day the most enriching thing about travel. Oh yes, it's the connections that you make that you you you're not going to make sitting at home. Um, and yeah, and the and the the growth that is forced upon you by the environment because you really you don't have the you know you you don't have the option to take a taxi home if you're not happy with things right forced upon you i like how you said it It is it it really really is we did a sit and we knew kind of what we were getting into largely but it wound up being even more intense than we thought and it was amazing one of the best six month stretches of my life in a remote jungle on the caribbean side of costa rica that it was an outhouse uh for three to four hour hike in from town other than the pig farmer up the road, no humans for four hours. The only way to get out is hiking. I'm sitting, we're having a downpour. That's why I've kind of got a little fuzzy here. That heavy yeah, yeah. Oh, um, tropical thunderstorm down in South Carolina, but it makes me think of there. One time it rained nonstop. There are some parts of the jungle around there that get almost literally, I know this sounds kind of cr- almost 30 feet of rain a year, 30 feet, you know, for I'm thinking U.S., whatever, but mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, no, that's, that's three feet good. in the yard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're thinking, you know, 10 meters roughly, give or take. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking when you're out there, forced upon you, middle of nowhere, our water source was good, but I had to go up this stream. And, and again, this is an extreme experience, but I faced so many fears going up this stream that jiggled the water supply because you had the water coming in through a hose from the top of the mountain. Very clever, yeah. very, very mm-hmm. clever, knowing that there are fur to lances, crocodiles, you know, stuff that would kill you just so quickly, but knowing you had no choice because if I don't do that, then we get dehydrated. And I don't know if I'd be able to walk into town or my wife, and I don't mean be able to, I mean, there are lands. So it's like this type of, and this was really extreme, but you see when I face those fears, like not a lot scares me because I've faced these fears along the way. And we do it baby steps, you know, you're not going to jump into that, but 
forced upon you. That's one of the extreme circumstances, but then even lesser ones, you feel self-conscious. So many people are so self-conscious, they stay in their own little hometown, and then you go somewhere else where you look different than everyone, they're speaking a different language, smiling at you, what are they saying about me? Cultural differences, and it's it's beautiful. It really yep. is because it helps bring that up. And then you'll see again, so many people out there in their mind, they are so kind and you know, welcoming and inviting. And you really do see the good in people yes. and the good in humanity when you get out there. Because for all our appearance of differences, there's a lot of love. There yep. really and, is. And, and a smile goes a long way. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, it's oh, something yeah. I really, really noticed. You know? And looking people straight in the eye and smiling to them, and it, it rarely, you know, you, you know, you know exactly the people to watch out for based on that. Yes, universal communication, the yeah. smile, direct eye contact, pleasant, even learning one or two words for some yeah. culture that's so important. Like when we were in Oman, we did two house sits in the Middle East, one in Qatar and Doha, and one in Oman. And even folks that wouldn't, we'd say, you know, shukran, you know, thank you. Yeah. Um, just, you know, salam alaikum. And it's like these little things and their eyes light up. Yeah. And then even just the pleasantness and people inviting us in for coffee and dates in Oman. And we're like, sure. And even if they don't say a word of English, just, you know, enjoying the, the coffee and the dates and smiling and, you know, shukran. It's like that because so many people around the world, it's so special and really sacred and you're so appreciative. Like think of a place like Bali, they're like, thank you so much for visiting our country. Like they want to share it and they love it. And they're so happy and grateful for you to be there. Like, it's not like, oh, we're grateful, you know, so you could, you know, pay for your motor. But no, they're like, we got invited to a Balinese wedding. We knew the people for two days. Wow. And what rented was, what a was that like? That must have been quite Amazing. an experience. I dressed up. I got fully dressed up with my headdress and the K-Chalk skirt, the checkered skirt, and, you know, like a Balinese. It was so cool. Yeah. Uncomfortable at first, but it was really, really cool. And my wife as well. And it was just an amazingly ornate. When you walked in, you had – and it was cool, too, because it was so ornate in some ways, but so informal. As soon as you walked in, you handed the gift – just six bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to try that when I go to a friend's wedding in New Jersey, you know, down the road, but, but, um, <laughs> six dollar gift, but, but you got brownies and these like iced teas and it was just such a different and cool experience. But then when you saw the, the high priest on the altar talk about ornate and all these different flowers, it was just like a, a genius artist, yeah. you know, putting it together, you know, so it was just unbelievable. So it's like, how am I ever going to see anything like that other than being in Bali <laughs> and being invited yeah. by kind and people. being open, to being open oh. and meeting people, which is why you were invited. Exactly. Because if you I, hadn't, if you'd stayed to the touristy areas, you never would have had, had that never. Experience. And this was outside. Sure enough, 20 minutes outside of Ubud. We did an Airbnb, but it's like, that's where you got to go. And then when they invite too, I know in the past, I probably would have said yes, but I would have been so self-conscious with fear and thinking, no, no, that's okay. I'll look stupid or ooh, it'll be. And I was just like, yeah. And my wife's like, yeah. And it was just, and the connections and the friends. And it's, it's so cool. It's, it's like a feeling of, even with the discomfort and the challenges at times, it's like being on vacation. All of us love that feeling of like, oh, I'm going on vacation. And then when you're doing that predominantly for years, and that's the feeling, it's a pretty good feeling. I think a lot of people like that. Yeah. You're making me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> with the challenges <laughs> oh no no it, it it definitely sounds sounds like it is it's been very motivating talking to you i can tell you oh uh, so, no thank you so much for having me it was really just been such a fun time to chat and share and no no we will listen we should do it again i, I love i love this i love this format i i like not really having prepared questions and just seeing which way the discussion goes versus you know these these formulaic type things the best interviews are always informal and the ones where it is so, and I get it. Everybody has a different approach. Like I'm not, I don't yeah. want to be judgmental or critical, but when it's really formatted and organized and I'll be honest, I've never read a question that people have sent me. And I tell them that sometimes other times I don't even bother, but I'm like, you could send them, but I work best in the moment and yeah. 
I don't, if it's something where I wouldn't answer, I'd be like, yeah, maybe move to the next one or I really don't want it. But it, I am spontaneous. I just, I never read them. And I've yeah. seen ones you have to read each one. And then some too, like when they're like, you have to read. And, and I just say, oh no, I have to cancel. I'm sorry. You know, I just didn't, yeah. something came up and then I don't, cause I'm like, it's just not, yeah. it's so fun to just have a chat between two people. And some of the chats I've done with my friends over the years on certain channels with decent followings, I've gotten like 60, 70 on YouTube, 80,000 uh, views. And why? Two guys chatting about succeeding online, just in the moment, free form, yeah. going over basic stuff. And this really resonates with people because day to day living, this is how we interact, <laughs> right? Well, or we, we should. Although yeah, it's that's a good point. Less and less, and that's well. It's why you know. It's why I love YouTube so much. Mm. I mean, you know, between the analytics, actually seeing who's watching, um, and the ability of doing stuff like this, where you're not on some format, there isn't. You know, there's a there's a clock running, but I'm just you know I'm not paying attention to it. Mm. And and you know you're not spending thousands of dollars to pay for keeping up hour long, you know, like, you know, thousands of hours in the end of content. It's just crazy when you think about it, right? You know, we have so many free tools at our disposal, yeah. when you have the right frame of mind, and you really are thinking of generosity, being generous and helping people. It's yeah. astounding how we can scale. It is absolutely yeah. astounding. And I think of some of the celebrities I've just even a couple chats with, and I've been able to go back and forth that have followed me on Twitter. And I mean, they're not like ardent, but even the fact that they looked at my profile and said, and they don't follow a lot of people. They're like, I'm going to follow yeah. this guy. It's pretty funny. And I'm just like, Oh, these are really, you know, some of the most famous. And yeah. I, was like, well, I, I could tell you've done a great job because I <laughs> immediately popped out. Uh, you know, when I was, when I was looking through pe you know, to find people to follow when I, when I set up uh, the digital refugee, the, the, the new account, uh, you did a fantastic job of it because you popped right out. And I said, I've got to, you know, follow this guy. Uh, and I was really happy when I saw your DMs are open. I said, I'm going to contact him. The worst thing you can do is ignore me, right? <laughs> you know? It's like, but that's it's, the worst thing. No it's one's the way gonna... to be. I appreciate yeah. that. And it is the way to be. Yeah, it's that's that's just that abundance mentality. And I still yeah. have to coach myself when I reach out and, say, hi, just, you know, give people a thumbs up or say hi, just a real, sh even if it's a yeah. short content, just to show them that I'm there and I'm listening. And then yeah. sometimes I see the ego is like, well, you know, you can, I'm just like, just keep talking to people. The one, one of the greatest gifts my dad gave me was from the beginning, he always just told us, talk to people, speak to people, open up. And he was never shy. When he was younger, he was. Yeah. And we, I was very self-conscious and my sister when we were younger. And then you see like he could, he could talk to a closed door and it's not even about himself, but he's just interested in people. And at yep. this age, the amount of friends and help, whenever he has any issue, like with his house, he has four people lined up for, he just has friends everywhere. He's connected. And you see the benefit of that reach out if they ignore, if they say no, or I can't, there's, there's still 7 billion plus people out there. <laughs> so it's well, a pretty exactly. good. Exactly. And, and as things, as things get more and more digital and more and more sort of separate, I think the more connections you can make with people, the better. Oh yes. You know, that, that's where the richness in life is. I found and you know, and the, the few years I have left to me, I want to spend them doing that, you know, not accumulating money. I want to accumulate, I want to live, you know, Same accumulate here. life, <laughs> you know, and Same friends. Here. And experiences and yeah. So, you see so that me, the meaning of everything. Yeah, that's well, that's where the meaning is. You're, you're quite yep. right. You know, it, 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 and I, I mean, I, I'm just very lucky in the sense that I've got a lot of the right skills for this kind of thing. You know, I've mm. done web development. I, I can do graphic design stuff. Um, I've always, I, for the longest time, especially when I travel, I've always been very open. And I've always met lots of people when I travel. Because I'll talk to anyone, you know, and it's rare the person who who sort of acts weirdly or ignores you or puts you up. You find them every once in a while and they're generally, you know, people you don't want to meet anyway. Yes. <laughs> but but mostly all you get is, you know, you get people. Pe pe I think a lot of people, it isn't that they're 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 put off. They're just shy. 
Yes. Or not, or not used to it or not used to being the one that'll make the fool of themselves. Whereas that's never been a problem with me. <laughs> that's a great skill to have because yeah. that not just the richness of life and that on a spiritual or mindset level, it feels so good. And then on the worldly level, if you find use for certain things, then it's so much easier for that to flow to you just to yeah. use, you know, to lease for a while, call it money or how it's like when you have those connections and those friendships, that stuff comes together. Like you think of so many folks that just feel so alone and they, they don't trust anybody and don't seem to have help. And they worry about all these folks that connected themselves by just opening up. And I found the same thing when you just, even when I'm running up and down the, the one trail over here at Buford, it's just, something as simple as hey how are you and then most people will just be like hey and put their hand up and smile and yeah a few other folks look to the side and that's okay too because like you yeah. said you wouldn't want to connect if they were that much in their own you know world but yeah. most people as long as you reach out they'll smile and, and then from there even you know sustaining the conversation and the next time you meet them you'll start talking and you know beyond that if you find you have a connection well who knows you're out you're out having dinner together you know? exactly Exactly. Or, or you're helping them out or they're helping you out. And yeah, it, well, it's how communities are built, right? And that's mm -hmm. really what we're, what we're missing, you know, missing the most these days. Mm, very, very true. And yeah, but, well, let, let's let's build it. Let's build it then, right, Ryan? I'm with you. 100%. So, so anyway, where, where can people find you? Uh, sure. A little bit of, of plugging and then we'll say our goodbyes and then stay online and we'll, we'll say our, 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 our goodbyes. As it yes, was. most definitely. <laughs> My site is bloggingfromparadise.com. So yeah. there I, you could drop a comment. I mean, you could reach out to me on Twitter or Facebook. If you look up Blogging from Paradise or my name, Ryan Bidoff, I'll come up. But really, the best site is bloggingparadise.com. Just drop me a comment. You see the okay. comments below on a post, or even if you didn't want to leave a public comment, you could always drop me a comment and I'll keep it private because everything goes depending. At least it okay, should, yeah. but depending because I get so much spam. Um, but you could also find me on Twitter or on Facebook. And yeah, I have a couple courses and manuals, a lot of blog posts, some travel posts yes. here and there because a lot of my readers are like, oh, I want to hear more about these places. Yeah. But um, but that's it. Yeah, that's where you could find me for a chat. Okay, and great. Okay, shy. great. Yeah, no, just just for my viewers, I'll make sure that all of your stuff is down in the description so it's easy for people to find your website and also your okay. your, your Twitter account. Thank and, you so much. Hopefully, if you see it and uh, you know, and some business goes your way. Anyway, uh, Ryan, thanks okay. so much. This has been a wonderful talk. Um, Martin, I really, I really hope so we do it again. Yes, and most I really definitely. I'm it in. And we're, we're definitely going to stay in touch. Most definitely. Thank you so much, my friend. Okay, no problem. Anyway, thank thank you to everyone, and see you soon. Anyway, take good care.